Dear Mexican, why is it that when you invite Mexicans to a party, they feel compelled to bring along 30 of their relatives? I mean, bringing along two or three people would be no problem, but we don't expect the number of people at our party to double by inviting an extra person. Signed, not enough food for everyone. Gustavo answers, Dear Gabacho, Mexicans and parties, was there ever a more spectacularly grotesque coupling? We drink mucho, we eat mucho, we fight mucho, we love mucho, we mucho mucho. Examining the Mexican propensity to party, Mexican Nobel laureate Octavio Paz wrote, the explosive, dramatic, sometimes even suicidal manner in which we strip ourselves, surrender ourselves, is evidence that something inhibits and suffocates us. Something impedes us from being. And since we cannot or dare not confront our own selves, we resort to the fiesta. It's such a beautifully poetic way to answer such a ridiculous question. <laughs> it is true, though. We do show up to parties with a lot of extra people. <laughs> like, I'm, like, I'm not going to pretend like that's not real. <laughs> Come on. That was an excerpt from Ask a Mexican, a hugely popular and long-running column where readers could ask a Mexican a question, no matter how ridiculous it may be. The year was 2004. Gustavo Arellano was working at California's OC Weekly, just your typical bustling and busy newsroom. One random day, his editor, Will, walked into the office and asked him a question. He's like, hey, I just saw a billboard for the Spanish language DJ, and I've never heard of this guy before. He's wearing a Viking helmet. He has, like, his eyes are crossed, and his name's Pylin. Have you ever heard of Pylin before? I'm like, oh, you're talking about El Piolin. Piolin. <laughs> exactly. Of course. And I said, you're pretty stupid for not knowing who El Piolin is because he's a big name. And, 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 and you're being stupid not because you're a white person and white people are supposed to know everything about Mexicans, but because you're the editor of a big newspaper. You should know what's going on in your backyard. That gave Will an idea. He needed more content for the following week's edition of the paper. So he thought, why don't we make a joke column where anyone can ask questions to a Mexican person? I thought to myself, okay, I think this is a dumb idea because I don't think people are going to like it, but let's just go with it. What's the stupidest question someone could ask me about Mexicans? And that stupid question was... It was the one that Will would ask me again and again. Oh, why do Mexicans call white people gringos? And my response was, well, dear Gabacho, only gringos call gringos gringos and Mexicans actually call gringos Gabachos. So they published the one-time joke column and included a caricature along with it. A stereotypical bandido with a sombrero and a gold tooth. It was just like meta, satirical, all with the intention of ridiculing clueless gabachos, not expecting anything out of it. I put my email at the very bottom. I said, hey, if you have any spicy questions about Mexicans, ask them to me, not thinking anyone ever would. But to Gustavo's surprise, they did. The day that the column first publishes, which is Thursday, we got 50 questions, like within hours immediately. And it wasn't just uh, Gavachos who were asking them. Uh, it was everyone. Everyone had a question. And that's how Ask a Mexican was born. Questions started pouring in and it became a twice a week column in the newspaper. The column reached thousands of readers and shed light on all kinds of issues that those with Mexican heritage were dealing with. From innocent, curious questions to really offensive ones. Gustavo answered them all. And for him, this work was a kind of activism, a way to talk about his Mexican roots from the perspective of someone who grew up in California as the son of immigrants. When did you realize that you were Mexican-American, that you were bicultural? You talk a lot about that identity, and I'm curious if there is a moment where you realized, oh, this is who I am. <laughs> I remember I'd get into these fights with uh, my cousins and friends growing up all the way through high school. No, I'm American. I'm not Mexican. I'm American. I'm American. Yeah, my parents are Mexican, but I'm American. But the light switched on for me when one of the trustees for the high school district that I graduated from, he announced that he wanted to sue Mexico for $50 million for educating the children of undocumented immigrants. And the reason was that people like me were ruining Anaheim schools. And that just pissed me off to no end. So that's actually what pushed me into activism, which led into journalism. Th there's a quote by uh, Sergio Cadiz, this legendary muralist. He said, my idea of being an American is to be as Mexican as I want. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what it is. And that, so that's how I identify. Powered by this drive, Gustavo dug in and answered questions week after week. 
I mean, I, I literally got everything. Horrible questions, hilarious questions. In the early days, I would get a lot of racist questions, but you have to remember, like, the columnist has the last laugh. The columnist has the last answer. So when people would ask racist questions, oh, man, I would get at them with a, with a metaphorical baseball bat. And Gustavo elegantly and ruthlessly cut them to pieces. When one reader asked, why do cholos love old English fonts? It's ugly, like everything about your culture. Gustavo responded, Dear racist, the popularity of old English script is a prism phenomenon that transcends race. Just check out some of the tats on your white supremacist cousins next time they show up at your family picnic. But not all racist questions were coming from white people. I would say I was the most ruthless to um, Mexicans who are racist against black folks. Uh, but anyone, I remember some idiot Mexicano starts talking all sorts of trash about Central Americans. I'm like, oh man, your question is so dumb. You're just as racist as people from the past, but in this case, you're Mexican and you're racist against Central Americans. You should know better. Us as Mexicans, being we are the biggest group, we gotta be better than the gabachos. Being racist against other groups, especially Central Americans, we're not better than gabachos. Frankly, we're worse. If you're new to the Pulso Pod, you should know we tackle this issue often. We have a lot of soul-searching to do when it comes to the anti-Black, anti-Indigenous attitudes still present in the Latino community. As you all can imagine, since taboo topics are the theme of the column, controversy follows. Of course, anytime you write about Mexicans, anything, people are going to be upset. People who hate Mexicans hated the column. People who liked Mexicans hated the column. But people who hated Mexicans liked the column. People who liked Mexicans loved the column. But it wasn't all controversy. I can say, though, that I got a lot, dozens, if not hundreds of responses. Oh, thank you. Thanks for asking Mexican. It really taught me to be proud of my Mexican roots when I was in high school. I mean, I want to get more into Mexican culture. What are some books I should read? What are some activists I should follow? What should, what should be some music I would follow? That's a beautiful legacy, Gustavo. And I think one of the reasons why it was so successful is precisely that satirical tone that you took. Can you tell us more about why humor and why that was a mechanism to accomplish this debunking of stereotypes that you sought out with the column? What I always loved about humor is that it was a great eradicator. The powers that be, you could shoot at them, you could throw bricks at them, you could yell at them, you could protest at them. They don't care. They don't care. They're always going to have bigger guns than you, bigger bricks than you, all of that. What they cannot stand is being ridiculed. In Orange County, I covered a lot of hate groups, like literal bona fide neo-Nazis. But that's where I quickly realized that, you know, making fun of them, they hated that. They're used to the insults, but the humor, they're not used to that because we're supposed to be scared of them. Well, I was never scared of white supremacy and I was never scared of calling out our own people for our own stupidity. So if I was going to do Ask a Mexican as a commentary of how ignorant people were about Mexicans, then yeah, I was going to use humor. Gustavo accomplished so much with his humor. He educated people, connected his readers to their Mexican heritage, built a solid community that tackled racism and injustice head on, all from his local newspaper. Words really can create long lasting change and leave a meaningful legacy of celebrating diversity. Gustavo's work is proof of that. The point of Ask a Mexican was always to, you know, debunk and deconstruct stereotypes and misconceptions about Mexicans in a way that educated, infuriated, and entertained. And it was all, the whole point of Ask a Mexican was always to punch up, never down. The column ran from 2004 to 2017. Eventually, Gustavo compiled all his favorite questions through the years into a book titled, you guessed it, Ask a Mexican. Today, Gustavo is a staff writer at the LA Times and host of their daily podcast. You can find his newsletter at gustavoarellano.org. You can subscribe to The Pulso Pod wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and tell a friend to give us a listen. Have questions or story ideas to send our way? Send us an email to info at projectpulso.org. The Pulso Podcast is produced and edited by Charlie Garcia and Lisanne Ramos. Additional editing by Steph Amaya Mora. Research and booking by Turilla Chavez, Rey Aguilera, Ana Mendoza, and Sandina Maluf. Original music by Julian Blackmore. Our cover art was designed by Jonathan Torres. And I'm your host, Luisa Larcón. 
The voices you hear in our intro, that's the Pulso team. Thanks for listening.